And now it's my honor and pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Uh, they will be speaking in the order in which I present them, and they will kindly limit their remarks to 10 minutes. After all four have spoken, I will allow the audience to ask questions to the panelists. So to begin with, it's our great pleasure to, uh, to have Prof uh, Ambassador and Professor Tom Simons with us. Um, Tom Simons is a former ambassador to Pakistan, to Poland, and an eminent emissary to the Soviet Union, I think, in the, is it the 80s and 90s, Tom? 90s. 90s, okay. Um, and has For assistance. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Quite a lot of authority um, on the matters that we're going to be talking about tonight. After Tom, it will be Nina's turn to speak. Nina's, uh, Nina Tumarkin is a professor of history here at Wellesley College and the current chair of the Russian Area Studies Program, which is bringing you this event. Following Nina, we'll have Professor Phil Cole in anthropology at Wellesley College. Uh, a special thanks to Phil for showing up in the middle of his sabbatical year. And finally, um, Professor Emeritus of Economics at Wellesley, Marshall Goldman, who is also the associate director right now of the uh, Davis Center for uh, Russian and, and Eurasian Studies at Harvard. Um, and with well, further ado, because we have a short time, I'm going to um, turn over the floor to Ambassador Simons. Adam, thanks very much. Let me let me invite people in the back to uh, take the chairs that are still uh, sprinkled through the audience, uh, rather than look like that sad phalanx uh, against the wall. You can sit on window sills. And there may be more chairs take, coming. But take uh, the luggage off the window sills and put bodies on them. There's one. There's one chair up here too. There's a chair in the front row. There's, there's one over here, too. I'd like to use my time, uh, if I may, to uh, situate uh, Russia in the world. This will be a Russia-centric presentation, uh, as advertised. Uh, but uh, to talk about, it's still 14 time zones. Uh, you can see it out there. And it is surrounded by uh, its former companions uh, in the Soviet Union. And the shrinkage of uh, Russia's world status with the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991 was a blow then, uh, and it remains a burden uh, for uh, most Russians, uh, less for the population uh, at large uh, than for the elites. But it, it is still a, a burden and gives a sense of loss uh, uh, for everyone in the area. And this refers not just to the loss of uh, superpower status. You remember under the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union had achieved uh, st strategic parity with the United States. Uh, you had a bipolar world. Uh, it was respected uh, and negotiated with uh, as an equal, uh, and that disappeared uh, in 1991. But Russia was also preeminent uh, within the USSR. Uh, and now Russians look out and see 14 republics of the 15 republics of the USSR who are now independent uh, and on their own. Moreover, there are 25 million Russians outside the new boundaries uh, of the Russian Federation, which you see uh, on this map. And the decade, moreover, has been accompanied by a sharp economic downturn, uh, a lot of economic distress uh, and suffering, the dissolution of the state services that people were used to, uh, under the Soviet Union, and therefore the change, uh, all these changes together, uh, give Russians a sense uh, of decline, uh, of loss, uh, of something uh, that has happened to them that they don't quite understand, uh, that they resent. Now, Russia is still the largest of these new independent states uh, by far, with about 150 million people. Uh, Ukraine is second with about 50 million. Uh, and it goes down from there. Uh, it has still by far the strongest army. Uh, it is still a nuclear power, uh, uh, more than 10,000 nuclear weapons, although that is coming down. So when the world looked at this new situation after 1991, what uh, we were afraid of was that Russians would focus their energy on retaining and reestablishing uh, local hegemonies, not so much that they would 
uh, continue to compete and cause trouble on the world stage, but that they would try to reimpose themselves uh, and retain the influence they had on their neighbors, the so-called near abroad. They came up with a, uh, a new word for it. Uh, and this was all the more true uh, since conflicts, uh, conflicts broke out uh, uh, throughout this space, uh, some of them involving uh, Russians. You had uh, so good at this. Uh, you had Moldova uh, over here, where you had a conflict between the uh, Romanian-speaking uh, majority and a Russian-speaking uh, minority. Uh, you had conflicts in the Caucasus between Armenians and Azerbaijanis over Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, you had conflict uh, in Tajikistan. Uh, down here between various elements uh, of the Tajik peoples. You had tensions with the Ukraine uh, over the Baltic fleet, over the Crimea. Uh, a whole range of conflicts uh, within uh, the Caucasus, within Georgia, the single state of Georgia, you had separatists moving. And most of all, within Russia itself, uh, you had a deterioration of relations uh, with the autonomous uh, region of Chechnya, uh, a Muslim population which had been deported during the war and allowed back uh, and sort of turned into a criminalized republic, uh, uh, increasingly seeking separation from the Russian Federation. So these were, were so many things that would tempt Russia, that, would, that might force Russia uh, to reassert itself uh, to retain and reestablish its influence. And in fact, w one strand of Russian policy since 1991 has been to do just that. But the truth is it's done it less forcefully than many feared uh, and with very mixed success. It has set up uh, something called the Commonwealth of Independent States, the CIS, uh, a grouping of various of these republics uh, centered around Russia, uh, but uh, you had President of Kyrgyzstan, Akayev, here last week, was asked about the CIS, and he said its major value was to cushion uh, Russia's loss rather than uh, to serve as a vehicle for reasserted uh, Russian uh, hegemony. It's not been an effective uh, organization. The three Baltic republics, uh, Lat Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, uh, have joined NATO along with Russia's erstwhile East European allies. Uh, of the trouble spots, Tajikistan has been uh, restabilized by an agreement among its warring factions in 1996 with Russian help. Georgia has, has uh, taken over, has reestablished control of one of its sub-regions, uh, Ajaria, without Russian help. But otherwise, all those conflict situations persist and fester. Chechnya has been through two wars. It's now in a second tranche of war since 1999, and the second is much worse than the first. In Russia, uh, it's hard to tell whether it's any closer uh, to getting control of that. Russia is respected by its neighbors, feared to some extent, respected by the world. It is a Security Council member. It has all those nuclear weapons still. But in terms of, of world politics, uh, it has become very much more a junior partner uh, rather than a co-equal. And the question is really why it has not been more assertive. I would suggest a number of reasons. I think first, the spectrum of, of opinion among Russians as to what uh, this shrinkage has meant uh, runs the full spectrum. There are Russians who actually welcome getting rid of the burden of empire. Uh, they felt that the, the, the strain of managing all these disparate peoples across these 11 time zones was a drain on Russia, distorted Russian development. So there are people who welcome what has happened. Um, but mainly, uh, Russian modesty, if I could put it this way, has been forced on Russia uh, by circumstance. And there are a number of reasons for that. First, Russia is economically weak, very much uh, weaker uh, than it seemed uh, under the Soviet Union. Uh, weaker than it would like to be. It simply lacks the resources to support uh, increased assertiveness on any sustained basis. Second, you've had an erosion of Soviet institutions, and that includes the Army. Uh, the Army has fallen on evil days. It's harder and harder to get people to serve. There are fewer and fewer resources 
uh, to supply them with. And this has been driven home, Russia's military weakness, by the botching uh, of the Chechen uh, war. Uh, third, the outside world, whose uh, respect and support Russia wants, including ours, is very wary of Russian assertiveness, uh, very careful, uh, very nervous about a reassertion of Russian hegemony, even vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors. And finally, Russia's neighbors, these new countries that look so weak and helpless in 1991, have actually had some success when it comes to nation building. Uh, for instance, in Ukraine, uh, in the early days, of the 90s, our CIA had an estimate that said uh, Ukraine had a 50 percent chance of breaking apart within five years. Uh, that is no longer true. Ukraine has really managed its problems not badly. It might be th have been thought, this was a situation from the beginning, that all this would change, that Russian modesty would change as you got some economic recovery. And you've had major economic recovery since 1998. You've had Putin's ascendancy since 1999. You've had the new global war on terror in which Russia joined since 9-11 uh, uh, in 2001. Now you have the shock of this terrible uh, terrorist crisis in Beslan, uh, in the Caucasus, uh, with all the children, 300 people dead, half of them children. So you, you, all of these things were things that you might think would have triggered a new assertiveness. In fact, there has been some. I think we all want to watch out for that. But I think the effects have been limited. The, the economic recovery has not been great enough to really uh, fund a major uh, reassertiveness. Chechnya remains such a botch that it drives home weakness uh, rather than encourages uh, strength. Russia has redefined its main threat as from the south. In other words, from terrorism, just as we have, that calls for alliance with the United or cooperation with the United States uh, rather than competition. And this urge for cooperation really has become the basis of Russian foreign policy. Uh, Putin overrode a lot of objections after 9/11 when he made it Russian policy to join with the U.S. in the war on terrorism, uh, and that has uh, been uh, reinforced by recent events. As a result, uh, Russia uh, functions in world affairs now as a junior partner of the U.S., not on every issue. We disagree on things like Iran, but Russia has been very helpful uh, with Iran, with North Korea. Uh, it has a function of kind of a go-between in the U.N. between uh, us and the French, say, uh, and Russia has continued to take and support hits. Uh, Georgia, had, you had a political transition from Shevardnadze to a man named Saakashvili, uh, mainly mediated by the U.S. and not by Russia. And Russia has been forced to take with a stiff upper lip the announcement that the U.S. is going to be moving 70,000 troops from Europe to somewhere, presumably nearer to Russia. In Central Asia, uh, we both have bases, new bases. We and the Russians and the Chinese are active there. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, as the economy stabilizes, if and as the economy stabilizes, that Russia won't become more assertive. It's something to, to look for, but there are strict limits to it. Uh, and I would say, uh, so far, so good. The countries around Russia are developing their independence. Uh, Russia is reestablishing a sense of pride and self-confidence. But so far, it is, uh, it's a cooperative partner in world affairs uh, rather than a troublemaker and a danger. Thank you, Ambassador Simons. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Nina Tumarkin from History. Uh, thank you. I'm very glad to be here. I also would like to say one word about Ambassador Simons, who um, had many uh, very, very high appointments, but uh, the most distinguished of all was that it, in the year 2002-2003, he was visiting diplomat scholar at Wellesley College. <laughs> I mean, forget, you know, ambassador to Poland. Anyone can do that, so right? <laughs> um, this this uh, annual panel used to be called Russia in Crisis. And we called it that the first year. And then the second year, there was a terrible crisis. And then we realized, you know, we can always call it Russia in crisis because we can be sure that something's going to have just happened. 
Um, and we now call the panel Russia Now, but of course Russia is in crisis and there's a lot to talk about. Um, I would like to go present two different themes, um, one a historical one, and one I would like to uh, move away from the center of main events and talk about Russian provinces and what's happening in the Russian countryside. But let me talk about, um, kind of present a, a little historical frame of reference for um, Mr. Putin's moves almost directly following the two-week wave of terror that uh, culminated in the atrocity of Dislan. Um, it, in his, uh, uh, his moves to curtail democracy that we know about, um, which included, of course, the proposal to replace elected regional governors with appointed ones, I was then suddenly reminded of the last time something like this happened in Russia. And the last time was in 1881 when the rather liberalizing Emperor Alexander II, the one who actually introduced forms of local self-government um, and a, a locally, local elected leaders, was assassinated by terrorists, by revolutionary terrorists of a very different kind. Um, the Russian terrorists then who were targeting the emperor and high government officials to destroy a regime that they thought was... Um, was really um, unsupp unsupportable and uh, bring about a new and better Russia. They never targeted civilians at all. Um, not to say that I supported them, but uh, this, it was a very different kind of terrorism. And his uh, Alexander II's uh, son and heir, Alexander III, responded by cracking down and uh, cracking down, first of all, of course, on terrorists and on revolutionary organizations, but by cracking down on whatever local self-government there was. He took these local elected leaders that had been um, brought to the fore by Alexander II and replaced them with government appoint uh, leaders appointed by the, the crown. Um, they were called land commandants. So uh, the voice of the people was really, really um, now s silenced. There was also an enormous growth in s the extension of censorship, um, the extension of the secret police. And this was so harsh that it ultimately drove many liberals um, not exactly to, into the arms of the terrorists, not exactly supporting revolutionary terrorism, but supporting revolutionary movements um, and really move, moved, brought, to, made society move very far left and created a kind of rift between the state and the society that was very important in um, leading to the collapse of the monarchy in Russia. Um, where Russia, where Putin, Mr. Putin's reforms uh, or so-called reforms will lead to, um, we don't know. But it's very interesting to look at that and watch for for changes. The second theme I wanted to raise um, are, as I just said, the Russian provinces on the Russian countryside, far from Moscow and farther still from the volatile regions of southern Russia and the northern Caucasus. Tens, of course, tens and tens of millions of Russians live in provincial cities and in rural areas, many of them desperately poor. And um, this summer, I, I had the opportunity to, uh, to visit some of these areas. In, in, in the northwest corner of Russia, I was at the port of, of, of Murmansk, and of Archangel in, in the White Sea. And then I uh, visited really the remote countryside in Russian Karelia. I am now pointing to the largest lake in Europe. It's called Lake Ladoga. And any of you who remember your World War II history will remember how during the siege of Lenin Leningrad, um, there was a so-called road of life built over Lake Ladoga to feed um, Leningraders during the siege that killed one million of their three million citizens. I found in, uh, in Murmansk and Arhangelsk, uh, or Archangel as we call it in English, really this sort of rusting hulks of what had been the Soviet infrastructure with a very struggling economy and very um, desperately poor people um, with very much still a Soviet mentality, a kind of Soviet resignation. 
Um, I particularly spent uh, several days in Archangel and got to chat with a number of the local population, and I noticed that they blame the troubles not on the central government. They blame the troubles on dark people. Uh, people from the Caucasus, the Chechens, Georgians, and Armenians uh, who have been um, fleeing to various regions, and they say that's the problem. These people are taking over their businesses. They're opening up all these shashlik places where you can get lamb, but they say it's lamb, but it's really dog, you know. And um, so I, I, you know, I said, well, well, that's very interesting. They call them churki. This is a term I had never heard before. Churuk is a piece of wood, like a cross piece when you saw a piece of wood so that they're, 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 they're lifeless like, like wood, but they're very dangerous. And I said, well, do you have a pecking order of these churki? Um, I mean, you're talking about Georgians, Armenians, Chechens. I mean, some of them are probably better, and some of them you think are worse. And how would you rank them? And the 17-year-old high school kid said, well, uh, probably the best of all of these are the, are the Jews. I thought, well, that's nice, you know. I mean, it's nice, sort of nice to be on top, not so great to be put in that, in that category. And, of course, on the bottom were, were the Chechens. But people are very confused. They don't know um, what to believe. They don't know whom to believe. And particularly I found this when I visited the remote countryside. It was the first time I ever spent really an extended time in tiny villages um, along the shores of Lake Ladaga. I mean, the good part is that's a gorgeous place to be. Um, and the region, I was very eager to go to that region. It had been closed not only to foreigners but to Russians until the fall of the Soviet Union. This western area um, had been part of independent, had been part of the Russian Empire, then part of independent Finland. And then when the Soviets invaded in 1940, Stalin gave the local residents 24 hours to get out. Um, some Finns stayed, but almost all of them left, and the area was repopulated by Russians from um, all over the Soviet Union. And um, so it was closed, it was poor, and it's, it's, it still is. Um, it, as you have houses that are so ramshackle and so uh, they're all made out of wood. And I said to somebody, oh, well, how interesting that people choose to not paint their houses. I mean, it's kind of depressing that they're unpainted wood. And they said, what do you mean not choose? They can't afford the paint. Um, and there are exactly two stores. Each one is a little, uh, in, this, in, in the village that I spent the most time in, called Tervu. Um, and there was uh, one state store and one private store. They look more or less the same with a few more goods in the, uh, in the private store. In fact, I was very excited because actually uh, in the private store they carried the brand of macaroni made by the, uh, in the factory founded by my grandfather in 1913. You know, it's, now it's private. There used to be the Leningrad State Macaroni Factory after the revolution. Now it's privatized. Very good macaroni. You know, we bought some and, 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 and we made it. Um, but people mostly live hand to mouth. I mean, this is where I saw what it's like when the old economy, the Soviet economy, was disbanded and nothing took its place. Um, most of these area, this area uh, was part of a, a big state farm, a sofhoz, a big, big state farm, which is now, now gone, although you still see the barns for the, for, the, for the cows that used to be there, that kind of thing. And the people that I, that I saw and spent time with just live by their kitchen gardens. Everybody's planting potatoes and root vegetables, so they have root cellars, and they live on, on fish and, and, and collecting mushrooms in the woods. Um, and and you have some pretty desperately poor people. The next door neighbor in a little that little hamlet that I stayed in, um, I learned from um, my host. We stayed in in the house of, of somebody and uh, learned that I said, well, this next door neighbor, he's very strange looking. He was well, first of all, he's got he's missing one leg, he's missing an arm, he looks like a huge bruiser with a. Very, and then I heard him sort of yelling at his wife and then funny crashes going on and, you know, in his house next door. And they said, oh, yeah, well, he's an alcohol, alcoholic. He's a, he's a wife a beater. He's a rapist and a, and a murderer. And I said, oh, really? Oh, yes, you know, he, he had been in prison several times and most recently for murdering a policeman. Um, and, of course... Maybe someone else would have said, uh, ooh, I think I'm, I'm leaving. I said, could you arrange an interview? Um, so, of course, I, I interviewed this man, 77 years old, and talked about how um, uh, he, he had lost his leg, uh, actually, as a sapper after World War II, uh, and mine had blown up. 
he made up some story about how he's lost his arm, but the but the but the, the my my host said that it had been cut off, chopped off in, in in labor camp when he had stolen from some people. So that's the way they they responded. Um, and this is a, this is somebody who really. Um, exemplifies the vo- the voice of the people at its at its worst. I mean, I asked him, you know, sort of with a microphone. You know, I sat there with my tape recorder. I said, "Hmm, let's see. Um, could you tell what was how could you compare the prison camp situation under Stalin, under Brezhnev, and under Yeltsin? I mean, because he, he was because he, he was first arrested in 1951. Um, he said, "Well, well, he must be a little crazy." He said, "Better under Stalin, because at least you got your ration and it wasn't stolen." Um, by people, and then um, and then he started talking about his politics, and I thought that I was in the 19th century, because I lecture to my students about how the old peasantry used to have sort of have this naive monarchism that the Soviets had called, where they believed that the Tsar is good, and the wicked officials are really taking everything away, and that's what he suddenly said. He said, you know, Putin's a good man; he's trying to get a lot done, but all those people in Moscow, all those communists and all those other bureaucrats are just standing in his way. If you just let the man free to rule Russia with an iron hand, things will really get better. Whether they will or not, you better come back next year at our Russia Now panel and find out. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. This is Phil Cole from Anthropology at Wellesley College. First, I, I first I want to thank my Russian Area Studies colleagues uh, Nina and Adam for letting me come uh, uh, to participate in this event. I'm on sabbatical this term, uh, and I originally was not going to participate. Um, but then Beslan happened, and I thought, well, maybe I do have something worth saying of, of interest. Um, this is the first time uh, I've spoken here where I have type notes to speak from. I guess this happens when you're on leave, you have more time. Um, I, I don't think that will make my talk any more coherent, uh, but we'll see. And I even gave a title to, to this presentation, uh, which reads, The Northern Caucasus Post Beslan. Tragedy leads to widen conflict, question mark. Um, I spent some time in the Northern Caucasus in Dagestan, Russia, which is the other, the eastern side of Chechnya. This summer, I, I went there to kind of assess the situation. I hadn't been there since 1998 because, frankly, I was worried about becoming a hostage, and the hostage-taking uh, business was thriving. Uh, and the, the picture that I saw was, was basically, now this is pre-Beslan, this was uh, in early August, uh, but it was a better situation than I had left in 1998, and I have kind of an optimistic sense about uh, doing work there in the future, I hope. Um, uh, I, I, I could relate anecdote after anecdote concerning that. Uh, today, uh, corresponding by, by email with my Dagestani colleagues, uh, post Beslan, they tell me that they're in a state of shock. Uh, and uh, being there, one learns such things. Uh, some people would tell me about uh, the road uh, to Grozny being open, all, and you can travel through Grozny. And other friends would say, it's open, all right, but you don't want to travel on it. Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, but let's turn to the uh, Beslan tragedy. 338 people, minimally dead, 31 of 32 hostages. Uh, pay attention uh, to, I, I believe it's going to be on October 13th, which is the 40-day mourning period ends, uh, traditional sort of time of respect for the dead. And then the gloves come off, and if you want to envision a worst-case scenario, uh, sort of uh, the start of, uh, of conflict ensuing. I hope that doesn't happen, but uh, the clock is ticking. Um, the Economist, the, the journal The Economist last month, uh, had a, a, a long and, and quite informative article on uh, uh, the situation in uh, the Northern Caucasus, and it had a graphic there which it entitled Litany of Horrors. And uh, it was listing the terrorist acts that have occurred since 1995. June 1995 was the seizure of the hospital in Budanovsk in southern Russia, uh, in which nearly 200 people uh, were killed, and uh, the Russians stormed the hospitals. Uh, they, they, the terrorists escaped. 
uh, and many uh, of the patients, uh, the people in the hospital, were killed, sort of set a pattern for future events. 17 terrorist acts since, 17, since June 1995. Seven uh, of, the, of those 17 acts occurred in Moscow and included subway and apartment bombings and so on. And if you add up the total number of listed killed, uh, it comes to around 1,500, or if you try to put these things in comparative perspective, that's about half the number of people killed in 9-11. But what's different, uh, and I would say qualitatively different perhaps on the psychology of people, is that uh, this has happened recurrently. It's, uh, Russia has a real recurrent terrorist problem, uh, and uh, it, it, it strikes right in the heart of the, uh, uh, of the capital repeatedly. Uh, I think it's fair and appropriate to be cynical uh, and critical of how uh, the war on terror is being used by Mr. Putin to consolidate and expand his power, but this should not uh, deny the reality of this threat, uh, which is real and, as I say, recurrent. Uh, another point I want to make, uh, uh, which I feel strongly about, is uh, I, I don't think people should use or the Western press should use euphemisms to describe some of the people on the Chechen side of things. Uh, Shamil Basayev, who is sometimes referred to as a separatist field commander, is really a cruel c killer with rivers of blood on his hands. He's Ru uh, Russia's uh, Osama bin Laden. Incidentally, I was told <clears throat> that he had already been caught uh, and bribed free on se several occasions. Now there's a $10 million bounty on his head, and let's see what happens. Uh, I don't know if those stories are true. I have no way of confirming them. But again, that's what uh, colleagues told me. Uh, last spring, uh, in this room in April, uh, uh, we had Dr. Valerie Tishkoff, who is the director of the Institute of Ethnology and Anthropology of the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow, come, who is an expert on the Chechen situation, having published several books on the topic and having broken with Mr. Yeltsin in the early 90s as Minister of Nationalities at that time, precisely over what was developing in Chechnya. And he gave a talk that I thought was uh, <clears throat> informed, very informed, sobering, and uh, 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 reasonably objective and hopefully and cautiously optimistic. I say this in the context of it being uh, pre Veslan. Uh, and he described the situation and that history, uh, which uh, Tom uh, has already talked about. A first Chechen war, uh, 1994 to 1996, 1996 to 1999, a time of de facto independence, but also anarchy, hundreds if not thousands of people being taken in this hostage business on both sides, just total anarchy. Uh, and this was a time when this man, Aslan Maskadov, uh, was the leader. Uh, supposed leader of the entire region. Uh, and then in 1999, August 1999, you had an invasion of Dagestan and the outbreak of the Second Chechen War, which as portrayed by Dr. Tishkov, the actual fighting in terms of fierce conflict came to an end in 2001. Uh, but what he was saying was since 2001, you don't have open conflict, but you don't have a peace either. You have a war-torn society and considerable enmity that's going to take a very long, long time to heal. And you have phenomena like uh, widows uh, avenging the death of their husbands by becoming suicide bombers or, provide, uh, or being paid money to, to give to their families if they do these things and so on. It's a very unstable and very uh, traumatic time. Uh, and then came Beslan. Uh, what's been happening since his talk, since last April? Well, in May, there was an assassination of uh, Akhmed Kadyrov. His son is now in command. And in June, some of you may recall, there was an invasion by rebels into Ingusheti, a seizure of some buildings, a killing of police that uh, close to 100 people died. And it raises the question of why Ingusheti? Uh, why such, uh, are, are these terrorist acts of desperation, which is of course what some, maybe even most terrorist acts are, but why this region of northern Ossetia and in, in Gusheti? Uh, is it an attempt to jumpstart a third Caucasian or, Caucasian or Chechen war, uh, becoming a war of the entire northern Caucasus? They failed in 1999 when they invaded Dagestan. Uh, but maybe now they've moved where there are still very real enmities and hostilities uh, 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 to the West, uh, and we'll have to see what happens as this mourning period ends. Um, 
I gave a handout. I don't have time to go over it. I, I'm fascinated by this region of the world precisely because it is as complex as it is linguistically, ethnically, confessionally, and historically in terms of people's historical consciousness. I can't go into that for lack of time. Uh, but uh, another legacy that should be mentioned in this context that is part of the Caucasus is this is the area which suffered the worst in terms of deported peoples, peoples who were de deported at the end of World War II by Stalin. And uh, there's a great PhD uh, waiting to be written on uh, Stalin as a Georgian, uh, instrumenting a policy that affected the Caucasian peoples and created more room for perhaps Georgians. Um, <clears throat> What will happen, I don't know. You, you have worst case, and there's no best case scenario, but maybe there's a tolerable better scenario, certainly. Uh, you'll have an increase in prejudice against the Caucasians, which Nina was referring to. I'm optimistic enough to believe I can jump, to, I can start my field work again in Dagestan. And I do want to announce, and this is my last point uh, tonight, uh, that the winter term program in Georgia which is run by Williams, Mount Holyoke, and Wellesley Colleges. Uh, we've just gotten the green light to proceed with that uh, this January. Again, paying attention to the news, of course, and seeing what happens. Uh, but it's always been successful in the past. And if anyone is interested in that, they should contact me uh, either tonight or via email. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Our last speaker tonight will be Professor Emeritus, Marshall Goldman of Economics. Um, uh, Vladislav uh, Surkov, who's the deputy head of the presidential administration in the Kremlin, uh, just um, gave an interview, a man who has normally not given interviews. This is what he said. <clears throat> there is now in Russia a fifth column of false liberals and right-wing radicals who seek Russia's defeat in the war on terror. And he went ahead to mention uh, the two parties, uh, Yabloko and a party of the national, uh, uh, or Nationalist Party, uh, that go by the name of uh, Yabloko is Apple, and Limonov, who's the head of this fascist party, is Lemon. And he went to say that the lemons and the apples are growing from the same, same a tree now from the same branch. And both of these groups are being sponsored by foreigners who seek the defeat of Russia. Uh, a paranoian view uh, of the world from somebody who's very close to Putin inside the Kremlin. Uh, I was with a group that met with Putin for three and a half hours uh, on September 6th, and Putin said much the same thing, not as shrill, uh, but indeed uh, reflecting this view of uh, being besieged. And subsequently, he then introduced a series of, or reduce, re, re, remove some of the reforms that had been introduced earlier by Gorbachev uh, and Yeltsin of the sort that you've just heard. And I'll get into that in more detail in a second. What does it mean? Where is, where is Russia heading? Uh, well, for all intents and purposes now, they've ended the elections. And there's a return to state control of the economy. Not, we're not back yet to the good old USSR, but we're pretty close to it. What I'd like to do in, uh, in 10 minutes, if I can, is discuss some of the highlights of that three and a half hour meeting, which was quite, quite a remarkable encounter, which occurred, if you pay attention to the calendar, right after the seizure uh, at Beslan. Uh, Putin was both charming uh, and fierce. Um, and he did, let me be the positive side first, he did have real problems of the sort that uh, Phil just discussed. Uh, he saw the school seizure as an attempt to ignite the whole part of Northern Caucasus. Um, he said, and he talked about history here as well, he talked about the fact that this was an area where there historically has been conflict, that in the Soviet period it had all been suppressed, but with the undoing of the Soviet Union, it suddenly all popped out. In other words, the pot had been put on the pressure cooker, uh, the top had been put on the pressure cooker, and now it had been removed. And if you look at the map that Phil had, has passed out to you, uh, he didn't have time, but I have time, so. <laughs> uh, what you see is that this matrix of different uh, regions um, is interspersed between people who historically have been at one another's throats. 
the seizure of the school took place in Beslan, which is in northern Ossetia. Northern Ossetia is Christian. The neighboring uh, region is uh, in, in Gushetia. In Gushetia is Islamic, is Muslim. And some of the people who were involved in the seizure of the school, some of the terrorists were from Ingushetia. There had been a war between the two peoples in 1992. And what Putin saw was this was an attempt to go back to that, to ignite this, to see what would happen in the 40 days that, that Phil was talking about. Now, again, this is a Tsarist uh, a problem. It's not a new problem. It goes back, as both Nina and Phil suggested, uh, in attempts to suppress, to take over this area, to Russianize it. And Putin discussed the Russianization of this area, saying, indeed, we have probably been t uh, too, too rigid. And then we also in uh, engaged in this deportation that Phil just mentioned. And he said he had visited some of those regions, and he was shocked by the way the uh, Chechens were, were treated. Um, and he said, we gave Chechnya de facto independence after the first Chechen war. But what happened? They couldn't control their warlords. And so they're now, they, they were engaged in all these other activities, kidnappings, beheadings uh, of a sort that indeed could not be tolerated. And then the invasion of the neighboring republic again, which triggered the most current war in 1999. Okay, so that's, in a sense, the way that Putin convinced me at least that what he was doing was really was a headache that was not simply solved by saying, okay, uh, we're going to get out of Chechnya. Okay, but what about the self-denial now and the fierceness that came out when he, you didn't want to be uh, in his way? Well, he was removed from reality in many ways, and forgive me for saying this, but there, he, you have, sometimes have a sense of this uh, in the United States uh, as well. Uh, one of the accusations that's made against President Bush, for example, is that he sheltered from life. He when he talks about the fact that there's been improvement in uh, Iraq, when you see the number of people being killed, uh, Americans being killed, the number of attacks increases uh, week by week. Uh, and he says, you know, it's, everything is okay. That's, uh, Putin is responding in the same way. Putin flew over earlier uh, Grozny, the capital of uh, Chechnya, and said he was surprised by the devastation that's taken place there because the whole area has been destroyed. How could he be? How could he be surprised? Well, one of the ways he's surprised is that he does not have interaction with other peoples, which is one of the main reasons that he met with our group for three and a half hours. Because when I'm told that he faces dilemmas like this, what to do? He cannot get hard questions from his advisors or outsiders in Russia because they're fearful now of uh, retaliation for asking uh, uh, impolite questions, whereas our group of, of foreigners was not going to do that. He, he did not use these words, but I, I thought I heard mission accomplished when he talked about uh, what was going on again in Chechnya. One of the things he referred to is the fact that just before our meeting there had been an election for the president to replace the man who had just been assassinated, Kadyrov, that, that uh, uh, Phil mentioned. And he said, everything is okay there. Eighty percent of the population voted in that election, which, of course, nobody believes but Putin. And nobody's telling him the emperor has no clothes. There were not those people out there. And so he goes ahead and, and, and says this. He did say um, he did negotiate with the Chechens, um, the man who had just been killed. He had been a fighter in the earlier war. We are negotiating with the people that are our enemies, so you know, don't criticize us for not doing this. He was asked, would there be a 9-11 sort of 9-11 commission, to look at what happened in Beslan, because immediately there was criticism. Today, in fact, I was talking to a Russian journalist who asked, why after 9-11 was there unification in the United States? Everybody rallied around the flag and the president Whereas in Russia, immediately there was criticism of what Putin was doing, which was quite remarkable. So the question is, in Russia, there, there are reasons why it, it was not the rallying around in Russia, but that's another story. But for me, what I want to point out is that Putin argued, saying that would, we would not have a 9-11 commission. We, the government, would do it. If the Duma, the parliament, wanted to do it, it was up to them. But there had been a, a nine, sort of 9-11 commission after the seizure of the theater at Dubrovka, and that came to nothing. So why should we bother again? Well, subsequently, Putin has reversed himself. But he went on to say that, indeed, your 9-11 commission in the United States was only a political sop. And I 
couldn't understand did he mean it was to the Republicans or the Democrats. What he did not understand was that the reason we had a 9-11 commission and it went forward was because the survivors of the family, of the families of the survivors of the people who were killed insisted on it and pushed it. And it was not a political stop at all. It really was something that, that the survivors of those killed really insisted on. Well, okay, looking back at that discussion with Putin, you can, if, in retrospect, at least you could see a hint of things that were to come, the kinds of things that uh, I think are, are, are so unfortunate. He had to do something. He couldn't just stand there. You know, he didn't know what to do, but it was clear the population, the public in Russia, demanded some kind of action. Now, some of the things that Putin subsequently did, indeed re re doing away with the elections of governors and, and in instituting uh, party lists for the election to the Duma, no longer direct elections from the region. Now, you vote on a party list, you don't vote somebody there, uh, standing there by themselves, um, had been proposed early, and Beslan provided uh, an excuse for this. A mandate, as you will. Also, he said he wanted to attack corruption. It was corrupt, he said, that there were these uh, police who took bribes for letting the terrorists uh, through. Um, and therefore, how to do this uh, to eliminate the, the, the elections for governors because corrupt people come in through the election. I will appoint them. I will be responsible. And indeed, that will then fall on me, and I'll make sure if they're corrupt, I'll get rid of them. Well, you can't do that with... 89 different governors. You can't keep control of them. He's going to do the same thing uh, in the party. For me, this is a step back to the USSR. Um, and now, even worse, by doing this, you're not going to get any feedback mechanism. You're not going to have any, anybody telling you that what you're doing is wrong. One of the beautiful things about the United States is that at least there are debates, there are parties, and real debates with real people uh, saying this is wrong, this is a mistake on, on both sides. More than that, we're going back to the USSR now that the people being put in these positions will have no legitimacy because they don't have a popular mandate. They weren't elected. And there's no, again, there's no media now because the state is controlling all the major television uh, networks. It's no, it's, there's still some newspapers and a radio station that uh, is independent, but even that is, is being uh, narrowed. Uh, so I had a meeting with Yavlinsky who headed this Apple party that no longer have a presence in the Duma because they didn't get enough votes. And he says there's basically no future. He cannot address a message to the, the, the nation at large because there's no television that will let them on because the state won't do it. And he said we can't raise money because anybody who gives us money who can be identified will sub be subjected to retaliation uh, by uh, Putin. But then Putin went on to ask, when we ask him, what is democracy and do you have democracy in Russia? He says, well, do you have democracy in the United States? Because you elect your president through an electoral college. Is that democratic? So it's, you know, I don't mean to say that he's blind to all these things. Well, okay, let me uh, just say briefly something about the economy. Same thing is happening in the economy. My question to him was about Yukos, the oil company, something I've been writing about. I have an article coming out about it in Foreign Affairs. What I ask him is, who is in charge here? You say you don't want Yukos to become uh, bankrupt. But people in your organization, people in your, in your government seem to be doing that. He said, his answer was, I don't want bankruptcy. Uh, and you tell me who's trying to bankrupt these companies, I'll fire them. Well, it's not quite so easy. Uh, but as there also turns out there are people in his government who are trying to take over some of the companies for themselves. In, in other words, former KGB people who are trying to take it over for the state and to some extent uh, for their own personal benefit. And after our meeting, he announced the merger of Gazprom, the largest uh, gas company, and Rosneft, which was a state oil company, now making them in a position to seize the assets of Yukos, as is indeed it goes through uh, bankruptcy. Well, the worst part of all of this is that the public still seems to support Putin. Well, let me conclude. Um, it seemed to me Russia never quite reached a healthy democratic and market system. But at least they were heading in the right direction. Now it's been reversed, and I think heading in, in the wrong direction. Under the best of circumstances, it's hard to see how this descent, as I would call it, uh, can be reversed. 
And given the terrorism that Putin is operating under, and indeed to some extent has legitimate problems to deal with, these are not the best of circumstances. So under the best of circumstances, it would be hard. Under the worst of circumstances, which, which Putin seems to be uh, facing, it seems to me that Russia has had a moment where it indeed enjoyed some democracy and some market liberalism, but now uh, those days are gone and only will be heading away from all those uh, reforms as brief as they were. Thank you, Marshall. Uh, I can now open the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, you can address a question to any of the four speakers. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I did. <laughs> well, it wasn't the kind of thing my uh, – wasn't so much advice as much as what to do about uh, – since I was focusing only on UCOS and, and Rosneft, I – had to cut out the portion of the question that had to deal with Rosneft. Um, what I was worried about is indeed that they were going to go away from this, from the, from the market and indeed return to that state kind of control. They really have now reinstituted the Ministry of Energy. Uh, and that tends to be wasteful and full of patronage. So just the, the advice was in part in the question implicit in the question, is this what you really want to do? Do you want them to go through bankruptcy? But that, that was the extent of it. So I really, I wouldn't say it was a one-on-one. -on -one. There were 20 of us there. And, and Putin's answers were always 20 minutes long. So, uh. <laughs> If you could take his place, what would you do? It's a fair question. Uh, if I could take his place, what would I do? Well, I wouldn't do what he's doing. Um, you know, and, and, you know. Again, this is not to be a discussion about American politics, but to the extent that, and Phil would probably answer this better than I, but to the extent that he uh, is pursuing what he's doing in Chechnya, and refusing to face what is there, being unrealistic about it, he's making it worse. In other words, the the, the Chechen thing is bad, but he's made it worse. And somehow or other, you're going to have to come to terms with some of these people. And uh, you're going to have to get out of there. What he sees, again, is it's this, this Beslan thing. It was not just a Chechen thing. It was to force them to move out of that whole region. And that's why his aide was saying the kinds of things that he was saying, that there were real suggestions that uh, there are those of us in the United States and in Europe who want to see Russia collapse. And you know, you, you, if you take that attitude, you know, it's, it's back to the Cold War mentality. So what would I do? I'd, I'd have to reach some form of negotiation with them. Um, and you just have to begin to remove yourself. I certainly wouldn't do what I'm doing in, in the case of, of the economy, what he's doing in the economy, which is really, the, I, for me, the easiest thing to handle. Um, just going after Khodorkovsky this way, and it wasn't just that, of course, he was also talking about going after others. Khodorkovsky is just the first. There are, almost all the oligarchs are not going to face the same kind of thing, unless they, they simply make themselves subservient to the state and to Putin. And uh, what he's doing, capital is flowing outside the country again, and I think that's just destructive and self-defeating. So everything that he's doing, um, I think, is, is really backward. And, and cutting himself off this way uh, and, go, and reversing, going back to the uh, doing away with the elections, I think is, is, is even, even Gorbachev and Yeltsin now are critical of that. I'd like to ask a question of both Marshall and, and Phil and, and or Tom, whichever ones want to reply. Um, do, do, do you, I, any of you think that Putin should pull out of Chechnya and let it go its own way? Anybody have any response to that one? You go first. Uh, my answer is no. I, um, and I know that runs uh, against some people's um, ideas and a, a notion that uh, people who strive to be free should be free. But um, uh, Russia um, lost 14 republics uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed. And you look at a map of Russia and the still ethnic diversity that is within Russia, uh, how many more states will emerge 
uh, where do you draw the line? Uh, the area of the middle Volga, which is very close to the Russian heartland, has been desc described as a non-Russian uh, archipelago uh, or an ethnic archipelago in a Russian sea. Uh, there are many different peoples there. And some of those republics have negotiated for a, a considerable degree of autonomy peacefully. And that's a, a model that I think should apply. Um, my colleagues in Dagestan are very proud of the war that was fought by Iman Shamil uh, in the early 19th century and didn't come to a conclusion until 1859. And Iman Shamil was an ethnic Avar, which is the dominant ethnic group in Dagestan. They are very proud of that fact, but they are also proud of and quote Shamil, who lived in exile and ultimately died in Mecca, uh, having made the Hajj. Uh, but for years he was in Russia, uh, that he thought that the future of the Dagestani people lay uh, in some form of political union with Russia. Uh, when uh, Shamil Basayev invaded Dagestan in um, August 1999, uh, the first resistance and the fight was between Dagestanis and Chechens. The Dagestanis did not join him, but they kicked out the Chechens and they wanted to... Uh, they, uh, they, uh, themselves to control their own land, and then the Russian troops came in to help them. Um, so uh, I think you can uh, uh, strive for and try to obtain considerable autonomy, uh, uh, but uh, why an independent state? You're landlocked there, you're squeezed. Uh, many people in the Caucasus don't like the Chechens, and I think that has to be said. It's not just the Russians that have this um, historically complex relations with them. I, I just don't see an independent Chechnya as being a viable state. Let me disagree. Um, uh, it's not easy, but you know some of the things you said I think would suggest that maybe it would be possible to do it. Putin again said much the same thing. It'll go right up the Volga uh, if we do this, and that's what they're trying to to create for us. But it, it's interesting in this battle with Georgia that's going on now between the Russians and the Georgians. Uh, s the people in South Ossetia say we don't want to be part of Georgia, we want to be part of Russia, in much the same way you just said with the Dagestan. Uh, it seems to me that uh, certainly the Christian areas in that region will stay with Russia. Um, and, and it may, you know, it, it, it won't be all that easy, but even though uh, Chechnya is landlocked, it's, it's you know, <laughs> you're fighting a battle that's never going to be won. And, and you know, it how bad can it be if if, if they're there? Uh, if if it's if can it be any worse than it is now? I think that's the that's the question. Never is a long time, Marshall. And it, 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 uh, uh, certainly it's going to be a long time before the wounds are healed. And uh, uh, many things have to get started that aren't anywhere near getting started before even that process begins. Um, but um, I don't think. Um, what be began as these ethnic conflicts, there are many ways to, to, to respond. One of them is historically. Uh, what happened in Georgia when the Soviet Union collapsed? What happened in Chechnya? Uh, if you have a sense of contingency in, in, in history, these were avoidable conflicts, but they spun out of control for a variety of reasons. Uh, they weren't inevitable, uh, but once they got going, uh, then more people died, acts of atrocity were committed, uh, decisions were made that uh, worsened the situation. Uh, the religious factor in the Caucasus today is real, but in the early 1990s was not so real. The, the, it, it became uh, a, a religious war during the course of the fighting. The uh, original constitution that the Diaf, uh, uh established did not talk about Shariat law. It had no mention of the Quran in it. It wasn't a holy Islamic republic. Uh, it was a secular state. That has changed as a result of the fighting, and it wasn't part of it. Uh, the Ossetians are, are not only Christian. They're, they're, they're a mixture. And there is a difference between the southern Ossetians and the northern Ossetians. Um, uh, I think a, a crux of the problem, I mean, we could, we could go back and forth on this, I'm sure, but a crux of the problem, and I don't pretend to understand all of it, uh, is that there are many people uh, uh, benefiting from the status quo. Uh, and this is corruption in the army, this is corruption in contraband trade that crosses from southern Ossetia into northern Ossetia. 
Uh, I was in southern Ossetia five years ago, and I was in a traffic jam of, 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 of trucks, of big semis, bringing in uh, alcohol to be, uh, spirits to be processed into vodka in uh, Vladikavkaz. I don't know all that was being uh, transported, but there are many elements, and, and this includes high-ranking generals and so on in the Russian army, who are, are, are profiting from this. And until that problem is addressed, I think you're going to have... Uh, well, I, I, I don't think I think, you don't. I think, I think maybe Tom, sure. Tom was done. Yeah, it's, it's, the saddest thing it seems to me is that Chechnya is the one reason that is the one region that could be given independence without triggering that brush fire up the Volga. In other words, it is so special uh, by history and by bad luck that you actually could give it its independence without doing a rolling drum fire of similar demand. But by lumping it with the 2,000 nationality conflicts that are latent and waiting to break out, you lose your sense of discrimination. And in fact, you are creating the brush fire that you claim to be suppressing. In other words, because uh, what has happened in Chechnya is what Nina described after the, the repression of 1881. You have, just as you radicalized a whole generation of youth by that repression in Chechnya, you have Islamized. A, a basically anti-colonial uh, national conflict, uh, and you, you threaten to have it spread if you keep repressing it as you are repressing it now. It is really tremendously self-defeating. But I also agree with Phil that politically, I, I don't see any way, not just because he thinks badly about it, but politically, that at this point you could give Chechnya its freedom. Right. Well, I don't, I, could, I don't, I don't. Could I just, I haven't weighed in on it yet. Just brief, briefly. But you asked the question. Yes, so I did. I, <laughs> so, uh, I get it. I'll so, tell you tomorrow you know, what I think. <laughs> just, yeah. I'll just be very brief. No, that's, you know, that's what they said in, in, in Algeria. And De Gaulle faced up to it. And I don't think uh, Russia is any worse for where with Georgia gone, Armenia gone, and uh, Azerbaijan gone. And it is a border area. Let me, let me just intrude as, as moderator for one second. Um, this, I w this is turning into a really a roundtable discussion, which is delightful and I think provocative. However, um, I want to remind everyone in the audience that you can raise your hand, ask questions, um, and uh, express your opinion. In fact, there are some hands. Okay, Volodya. Um, my question to all of you. What's consideration of um, uh, action by Putin in regard to this law? What they didn't do and what they, he did, and they not going to do investigation in full. They did investigate in full. Uh, previous terror act uh, in Moscow, um, to go to the theater, uh, no source to. But uh, his response to this terror act is very unusual. Uh, he decided to appoint it instead of elect 89 gubernators. He decided to do, uh, establish uh, people's uh, uh, army or whatever independent uh, formation. Uh, don't you think uh, all this terror act in this law was provocation organized by Putin as a professional can you be operator? No. I, I don't think so. I don't uh, and I have to say that I, I asked, I remember asking that same question in 1999 when the apartment houses were bombed in Moscow. And was that kind of done so that Putin could unleash this war? Um, and um, maybe that, <laughs> maybe that was so. But I really don't, uh, I really can't, wouldn't believe that, that this could have been well, done. You just cannot imagine. Well, no, we well, can imagine. No, no because, I, I, because I, I, would, I would agree with Nina that the uh, apartment house thing is really questionable. But this is something more. What I could also say, of course, is that the way it was handled, Putin has got himself into some difficulty because, by the way that it was handled. Uh, the, the criticism that went on, that the fact that 11 of the special troops were killed in the process, that so many uh, children were, were killed, um, this, is, this is more than, than, uh, than uh, I think Putin is capable of doing. Uh, and it, Well, no, whoever counted people's life, it's true. It's a low count. Uh, but but this, this, the way it was handled, uh, the way they, you know, by understating the number of people held hostage, 
It was handled so badly that if they were going to do it, at least they should have done it efficiently to make Putin look like a hero. This is really, uh, they were going to move ahead with these government reforms anyway. Uh, but uh, but it's, I think this is, uh, this is a tragedy that I, I think really is more than uh, Putin was capable of doing. There were some other hands up. Yes, in the row. Um, seeing as Putin has already taken some constitutional reforms into his own hands um, in, terms of, in terms of the governor being um, appointed and the fact that he had such a landslide victory in the last elections, do you think that he would change the constitution and, um, to allow himself to run for another term? So the question is, when we, should we repeat it? Or did everybody hear that? Right. Would he change the constitution? Well, I, 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 you know, the other there's another aspect of this whole change of, of electing the governors that I did not mention. Nobody else has mentioned. He's done away with term limits. Before the governors had term limits, and now they can serve as long as they're nice to Putin, as long as they want. It's like academic tenure uh, in, in, in some sense. So, given that, I didn't think so before, but I think now there's a possibility. And this Surkov that I quoted uh, indeed says that there has been maneuvering by these uh, uh, you know, shadowy groups to affect what's going to happen eight years from now, and they're already beginning to maneuver. So it may very well be that this group of, of uh, Soloviki, you know, the law and order types. Are, are worried about what happens after Putin because they're now on the, the top of the roost and then once Putin is gone, it's possible they could lose some of their prerogatives. Um, with regards to the increasing religious aspects of conflict in Chechnya, I know after Beslan, Putin sort of tried to implicate that it was somehow related to the U.S. war on terror, and I was just wondering if there's any basis to that at all, or is it just his political maneuvering? Well, I, there's certainly political maneuvering going on there. I think that's pretty manifest and, and so on, that you can play this card. Um, but I think it would be wrong to be totally cynical or... Um, uh, Everyone I've talked to, uh, and I can't confirm what they say, but people I talk to uh, admit uh, some sort of connection with um, uh, an international terrorist network. Uh, this uh, 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 also applies to this man, Basayev, whom I've referred to on several occasions, uh, a training he's received. Uh, I don't know exactly how things are being funded. Uh, there's still plenty of arms that, that are everywhere, and those probably come locally, arsenals that were seized and so on. Uh, but if people are buying themselves free, which I was told about, uh, who's, who's paying for that? Uh, there is a connection at some level, but I'm, I'm not capable, and I don't know if anyone is really capable of saying at what level uh, that is to a, a larger terrorist network. Uh, in Dagestan, I saw in 1998, and I was uh, pleased to see less of them uh, this year, but there's still a presence. Uh, these people they call Wahhabis uh, that are clearly uh, uh, professing uh, manifestly their, their Islamic beliefs, but associated with that is a, a kind of very pure uh, Puritan form of Islam uh, with political overtones. So uh, I don't think you can rule out and just say this is all political maneuvering. It certainly is political maneuvering. Um, yeah, yeah, the, the, trouble, the trouble with it is, uh, and there, as Marshall says, there are parallels, is that the authorities there, Putin, are using whatever there is of a real danger, and you know, not to, to minimize these, these connections, in order to justify and consolidate and push forward a political program which existed without them. In other words, they're using on the argument that the war on terror puts us in a new historical era and that the threat is so severe uh, and so pervasive and, and so new that we, we, can, we, we must concentrate, centralize authority, simplify government, uh, uh, and uh, really override ma major elements of our basic constitution 
uh, in order to fight it. That seems to me to be an issue in this country, and it's certainly an, an issue that's emerging uh, in Russia. I think it's dangerous for Russia. Uh, I think it's dangerous for this country, if I may say so, uh, and, and for the world, because it seems to me that terrorism, this kind of Islamist radicalism, of, of feeding this kind of terrorism is a threat. It's dangerous. It's something we have to take seriously. But it's something that we can meet and, and, and face down uh, within the confines of our ancient liberties and our ancient constitution. I think the same thing is true of Russia. My question is to Professor Jamarkin. <coughs> um, I come from a communist region, and I was very happy to hear uh, that our communist was among the regions that you chose uh, to visit. Mm-hmm. And in fact, our family lives in our communist capital town, which is 60 kilometers north of our communist. And I talk to my friends and the members of my family very often on the phone. Mm-hmm. I visited uh, this region just recently. Mm-hmm. And of course, we discussed a lot of the current political events. And mm-hmm. I never came across the opinion that, uh, as you described, as a 19th century peasant's attitude that the Tsar is good at the No, 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 no. That wasn't in our Hangels. <coughs> that was in in this little village of on Tervu on the shores of Lake Ladoga. No, Arhangelsk is a city with, I talked about Arhangelsk uh, talking to young people especially who were blaming the incoming um, people from the Caucasus and so on. Yeah, no, 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 that, that's the, the naive monarchy, no, no 19th century And concerning this uh, attitude as well, because um, I visited uh, Sibirpinsk, which is a small mm-hmm. city in Arhangelsk just last winter, where I was given a lecture it was a public lecture given in a little public library for local intelligentsia, mm-hmm. and I was extremely impressed by uh, by the local activities which were going on there at, as compared to St. Petersburg, which I consider as my second native city where I spent not half of my life. And I really didn't see this, so to say, backward or naive attitudes. Um, maybe we talked to different people. Right. I mean, I was talking to people on the street. Yeah, right. right. And I'm just wondering, uh, what kind of people did you talk to? People, just how, people on the street. And how many people did you interview? And to what extent can they represent the professional, the provincial, uh, uh, so to say? Very small sample. Very small sample. So it's not, I mean, I, I, I was just really conveying my impressions. Um, and in Arhangelsk, I really was talking to people on the street. Um, it was on the shores of Karelia in the small village of Tervu that I spent a more extended time and got to speak with people of various classes. I, I chose to focus on this one man, but there, were, there was also some very interesting intelligentsia that I talked to who had other aspirations, but in 10 minutes... Um, I decided to kind of mold my talk. I want to say that intelligence uh, represents uh, the public opinion, as it always was not the case in Russia. But I just want to say that the situation is more complex. As for oh, yes, it is. Of course. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. There's a question in the front row. Um, my name is Anna Zariva, and I thank you for this panel. And I would, I'm just very happy that this comment came in as my country house, like our country hut, rather, happens to be one of those unpainted houses in the middle of um, anywhere, basically in Kareli region, and that is the region to the north of St. Petersburg, and we happen to go there in winter and then during the summer and see all the people who live there constantly and people who just come there. And I, with, with all honesty, there is such a variety of opinions among people, and it is so easy to present to a public that doesn't really have this opportunity to know this variety of opinion, a couple of opinions that are strong and impressive, and just the fact the way that people who perhaps do not have this opportunity to question themselves or question other people, to have a very erroneous opinion and very solidified opinion of that's how the Russian peasants think. And it saddens me a lot because I find that it happens a lot in this country, and I just hope it didn't happen. Yeah. Well, no, thank you very much, and, and uh, yeah, sorry. That was just a comment that I'm just glad that it came from somebody else before me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, but I'd like to then just respond, if I can just take two minutes, that I, that I would have had my talk been longer. I had in my notes um, to talk about um, what is happening in that region, too, um, among, first of all, a revival of, of religion, and also the, the local intelligentsia that I spent, I spent my time really mostly with local intelligentsia who were involved in developing a Karelian I- national identity for the region that had not existed before. And so they're very interested in, in those cultural efforts, which is really what I was there 
um, discussing with them. But I, uh, but I found it really very, very interesting to speak with some of the really poor local residents as well. And that's what I chose to write uh, to talk about. Oh, you have the question. Yes, oh, I also have a question, which is not directly related to the Islam, but it kind of springs along from our conversation about Putin. When we speak about Russia just now on this panel, we talk about Putin, we seem to kind of forget that there is also a parliament, that there is also a Duma in Russia. So I was just wondering if you could perhaps comment on your perception of what role is the parliament playing right now, is the Duma playing right now, and is it going to play? Um, in, I found out that among the political scientists and whatever Russian um, area studies in England, they tended to um, put big hopes on consolidation of parties, as they used to say that dispersed parties and fractured parties were not capable of creating any sort of different opposition to the president, and that's why Russia has been ruled by decree more so than by laws passed by Duma, and then there was sort of optimism attached to the fact that there is, despite the fact that the, the unity is put in sort of base party, there is consolidated parties now um, in the Duma. So I was just wondering what were your thoughts on the parliament versus Putin? Well, I think it's not hopeful. Um, what What's happened in the, in the result of the last election, when indeed neither one of the Democratic parties, SPS or Yabloko, had any standing, did not receive enough votes to qualify uh, to sit in the in the Duma, they're no longer there. This again, this quotation by Sir Kov suggests that there are there's an attempt to create an alliance. Kalkmarov is. Uh, former member of SPS is trying to create an alliance of all these different groups. And what he's trying to do is to say these people are being financed by the West, they're being financed by outsiders, and they're subversive. There's this alliance between the right and the left, uh, threatening uh, those of us in, in the middle, trying to cut off their heads. And they're so weak, it, it, it's hardly worth the effort, you would think, for, for, for him uh, to go to all this trouble. But it's clear they want to suppress this kind of group. They want to taint them. That anybody who opposes Putin is really being financed by the West. You know, non-government organizations now are under threat as well because they have to re they have to report where their funding comes from. If their funding comes from outside the country, they are subversive and they have to pay a high tax on this. Uh, it's it's really quite disturbing. And the point is that even if they do get together, uh, they can't get funding. And they can't get exposure nationally on television. And that's that's where the dilemma is. So that. There are a few voices. Uh, Rishkov in the, in the Duma has been very outspoken, but he has no party, he has no alliance, he has no organization. And now, when you ask, I, I don't want to go on Duma, but ask Yablinsky, what's the hope? Where do you see hope? He said, well, look, uh, Gorbachev came along and without some organization pushing him, and sooner or later we'll come back to this, but I don't see them heading in this way in my lifetime. I think it's clear that we could uh, continue this discussion for a very long time. However, uh, as the French say, there are other cats to be whipped. And uh, in particular, there's a president, vice presidential debate that's about to begin. So I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. And please join me in a round of applause. For